Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about milling machinery. Uh, we talked about turning and boring last time, today we're going to talk about milling. Uh, so, milling, again, we're talking about industrial revolution type time frame, so uh, somewhere in the uh, early 1800s is when the mill as we know it was invented. So, you know, somewhere around 1818, so we're talking an almost 200 year old process here, and you know, there's things that have changed about it. Uh, but the basic process of turning a cutter and moving a part into it has, has been the same for that that long. Uh, so, and again, a lot of this just comes from the demand to make a lot of things. You see a lot of this is with firearms. It's mainly because you need precision machine parts. Uh, you get to interchangeable parts. You need to hold good tolerances. You need reliable and quick way of, of removing metal in a very precise way. Uh, and there, that's, that's what milling does for you. So, uh, main difference between turning and milling and turning, we need, we're turning something that has a circular pattern, a revolved profile. Uh, in milling, we're usually making flat surfaces. Uh, there's some books on, early textbooks here on milling. Um, you know, honestly, I haven't read any textbooks on, on milling other than the book for this class. Uh, I, you know, really a lot of this stuff you just learn by, by doing. Uh, so that's something that you, know, you all are kind of in an unfortunate situation on. You might not have gotten into this on your clocks. Uh, if you want to learn this, uh, what I recommend, you, still all, you should all still have a year or two or three maybe left. Uh, where I learned really to uh, run a mill and a lathe really well was on a design team. Uh, that's a really good opportunity to, to learn how to use, use this equipment. So uh, that's something that if, if you really sort of feel like you got short change and want to learn how to use this stuff, and get on a design team. They Most of the teams would be, be glad to teach you how to run a mill or a lathe. The center's got uh, lots of design centers, got a lot of programs uh, for safety on, on this equipment, and then also sort of kind of baby step you into using using it. So uh, anyway, that that's one opportunity. You know, If you feel like you want to learn this and you're not going to get to this semester, that's one way you'll, you can do it while you're still in school. Uh, milling, we have a non-rotating workpiece. At least we're not rotating it to make a chip. You might turn it to, to cut a certain profile with a rotary table, which I'll show in a, in a little bit. Uh, but you're not turning it to make a chip. You're turning the cutter to make the chip. And rotating tool, uh, interrupted engagement in that your tool is going to enter the material. It's going to shave a chip off. It's going to leave the material. So you have discontinuous cutting. Uh, and so you inherently get uh, little bitty tiny chips as opposed to big curly Q chips like you do when you're turning. Uh, your chips also change thickness too, uh, so they'll, they'll either start thick and in thin or start thin and in thick depending on whether you're up or down milling. Uh, your cutting forces are variable. Uh, your feed force is perpendicular to your spindle bearings uh, and uh, that can cause some, some wear issues for spindle bearings. Uh, again, primarily to make flat surfaces for milling, uh, we can have a multi-tooth or a multi-edge cutter. We can even have a single edge cutter for fly cutting. Uh, surface finish, uh, you can do a little bit better on a lathe usually, uh, but you can get decent surface finishes with, with milling. Uh, higher material removal rate, it just depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're doing a finishing pass, you might only be removing ten thousandths of an inch or so. Uh, you can do some pretty serious depths of cuts on a big CNC machine and remove a lot of material in a short period of time uh, in, a, in a you know powerful machine that's got full coolant uh, with good, good roughing tooling. You can remove a lot of material in a short period of time. Uh, tolerances, uh, so down here, again, the best case somewhere around a half a thousandth. Uh, that's a pretty good best case, though. Uh, in general, you know, somewhere around one or two is where you start really have to paying a lot of attention, have to pay a lot of attention. Uh, sub thousandth accuracy, it gets, it gets difficult. Tool deflection and workpiece deflection and uh, just the quality of your machine really start to matter a lot. Uh, slotting around a thousand, flatness, uh, and you're down into the tolerance of your machine, somewhere around a thousandth of an inch per, per foot flatness. Again, all of this is assuming you're, you've got good work holding and good tooling. If you don't have those things, this can go down really, really quickly. Um, spindle orientation and RPM. Uh, spindle orientation is a big one, uh, vertical or horizontal. Vertical is pretty common. There's some horizontal mills out there too. Uh, vertical is the most common, I would say, nowadays based on the machines I've, I've seen in most machine shops. Horizontal is pretty rare. Uh, and manual or CNC. Uh, some big, big machining centers will be horizontal, uh, but just a regular manual horizontal mill is actually a pretty rare thing. 
uh, capability, you know, as far as accuracy, precision, and whether or not it's CNC controlled. Uh, machine capacity, how big of a part can you machine, how much power do you have. Uh, obviously, as the machines get more rigid and more precise and more cap bigger cap capacity, more power, they get more expensive. Uh, tool changing. Uh, most manual machines have, don't have an automatic tool changer. You have to manually change tools and manually set the height up of each tool when you put it in. That can be very, very slow when you're trying to make a lot of parts. Uh, most CNC machines will have some kind of automatic tool changing that, that guaranteed tools are indexed correctly. Uh, so you only have to set the tools up once. Uh, and then also, it's really quick to change tools. So early milling machines uh, look a little bit different than what a manual mill would look like nowadays. Uh, here we've got a horizontal mill. Uh, we've got some way of holding the, uh, th the work piece we're trying to machine. Uh, and then we've got a turning cutter here. Uh, so this is driven by a belt from you know steam driven or a motor or something like that. Um, these vary in size from little goofy tabletop mills like this, which I say goofy, but you know these actually can be pretty pretty useful. Uh, essentially, it's a drill press where you can move in this direction and this direction in addition to moving up and down. I mean, it's really the difference between a drill press and a mill. A drill can go up and down. A mill you can go up and down and translate in the x and y direction. To uh, big gantry mills too, but the basic process is is the same. Most common manual machine is the knee and column. Uh, I always heard, always heard knee and column, not column and knee, but uh, a knee and column machine is pretty common. Your Bridgeport style mills are knee and column. Uh, ram type, which is usually a derivation of a knee and column. Uh, fixed bed, uh, planar type. So there's a few other kinds too that are more specialized, but uh, your, your normal mill is a knee, knee and column. So this is about the, the most common type, the Bridgeport type mill which if you've ever you know been in a machine shop this is one of the machines that every machine shop has or you really I don't know if you can call it a machine shop if it doesn't have one of these uh, so one of these and an engine lathe those are the two two most fundamental pieces of metal working equipment in a shop are a mill like this and some kind of an engine lathe so the knee is this portion right here that slides up and down on a column uh, there's a saddle that goes on top that's going to allow the motion in the y-axis this would be the y-axis motion uh, and then the table would sit on top of the saddle and that would form the x-axis uh, and that gives you two degrees of freedom this whole table can usually be cranked up and down uh, the knee can be cranked up and down that gives you your z-axis uh, the head up here will have a quill that can be fed up and down and that forms another z-axis so you really have two z-axis axes in these and you might use one or the other for drilling you'll use the quill for uh, like facing and removing a regular amount of material like if you wanted to move fifteen thousandths of an inch off the face you would adjust uh, the, the knee up and down by fifteen thousandths of an inch you wouldn't try to do that with the quill uh, the X, Y, and Z axes will, will all be very able to be precisely moved. They'll have hand wheels with indicators somewhere around the thousandth of an inch, uh, and you can move them precisely. The quill, usually you can't move fairly precisely. It'll have uh, a scale on it, but it's usually not something capable of being moved in a precise way. Uh, this is a knee and column uh, horizontal machine. You have the standard knee and column, but the milling direction is is that way and that's a lot more rare in modern shops than a, than a vertical style knee and column. Uh, horizontal machines again pretty pretty rare we've got one in the, the shop for this class uh, and it's used for one of the operations in the clock uh, but again, it's not used a lot for facing for slab milling uh, for straddle and side milling um, you know this one has got an extra bearing support so it's in double shears so the tools are more rigid uh, and these, these are, I don't want to say an older process, but they're just not used as much as, as they used to be. You know, a lot of the stuff what we do on this, we, we do, can do in a CNC machine really easily. And so we don't really, in, in anything else we can sort of make happen in a vertical machine. Uh, knee and column vertical, and this is the most common manual style of mill for basically any kind of milling you would need. Uh, end milling, peripheral milling, face milling, drilling, boring, any kind of milling operation you can, you can do on these. It's a very, very common, very, very flexible machine. 
Uh, again, here's what just regular vertical knee and column mill looks like. This is one's got a ram on it where you can move the whole head in and out and that sort of forms a redundant y-axis. Uh, you usually just clamp it in place and then use the y-axis down here. So you basically use that to uh, reposition for like a really big piece of stock uh, or for a really long cut. Maybe you can use the ram to move the head in and out. Uh, the head usually can tilt this way uh, about an axis out of the ram. Uh, which can be fun because it's usually very top heavy and you don't want to drop this thing. That's what usually these four uh, nuts, you, you release those gently. You, don't, you still want a little tension on them, but you release those a little bit and then there'll be another nut you can turn and it'll turn the head so you can tip it. Some of these things will be an axis this way here that allows you to tilt the whole thing up and down. Uh, and that'll allow you to cut anything at whatever angle you would need. Uh, once you do that though, you have to indicate it back in if you want it to be nice and perpendicular to your surface. Uh, it's something that uh, you, know, you really have, have to make sure your machine's set up very precisely before you start trying to make really accurate cuts, especially if you're facing. If you're facing and this head is at any kind of an angle, uh, you get step over when, from uh, cut to cut and it is a really crappy surface finish and doesn't, doesn't make a flat part. And this, you need one of these. If you have, a, if you want to have a machine shop, you need you need one of these. You need one of these in a lathe. Uh, there's different sizes. You know, anywhere from one to two or three or four or five horsepower. Uh, two horsepower seems to be pretty common. Uh, you can get these with power feed, usually on the x-axis. Uh, you can get these that have been converted to be CNC machines, and so it'll run the axes for you. We've got one of those in our machine shop, uh, the student machine shop for design classes. Uh, it was really really great machine. Some of these will run on single phase, uh, mostly it's three phase, but you can get them that will run on single phase power for like a home shop or something like that. Bed type, so when you start getting into CNC machines, uh, you're not going to be moving this knee up and down. Uh, the Z motion will all be on the spindle. So the spindle will have form the Z axis, you'll have the X axis and the Y axis here. Uh, and you just when you get to have bigger machines, uh, it just gets more complicated and more it's more effort to raise this platform up and down. Uh, it's going to be more more effort to raise the platform than it is to, to move the spindle. So it's just easier to move the spindle. So most CNC machines work like this. They're a bed type machine where the X and Y axes move, uh, and then the spindle moves up and down. They're more rigid, which means they're more accurate. Uh, yeah, the, most CNC machines will be, be like this, and especially you start to get more, more power. Uh, you see some weird machines like this, double-headed vertical or horizontal mill. Um, yeah, th these you don't see as much anymore. You, some shops might have them for specialty applications, but you know if you look in the machine shop of like a World War II battleship, you'll see stuff like this. If you look in a modern shop, I mean, you'll you'll see a lot of things that you would do on a machine like this done on a CNC mill, and you'll see a vertical mill for sort of the day-to-day -day generic stuff that needs to be done by hand. Uh, they scale these things up to gigantic gantry mills, <clears throat> where you've got a uh, uh, a moving gantry that moves this way, moves this way, and then moves up and down, and then the, the work piece is absolutely fixed. Uh, again, these machines can get gigantic for machining massive molds for like stamping, uh, composite molds, uh, again, bigger, higher horsepower, you know, big, big room size machines. Uh, is there another type here where uh, the whole, basically the whole, the, the tool moves, the, the part stays stationary. Uh, so here's a couple of planer machines. Again, part stays stationary, the gantry moves. Uh, same thing here, part stays stationary, this big gantry moves. As you can imagine, you know, these are big, precise, heavy machines. They get very expensive very quickly. But uh, for machining massive forgings, you need one. For uh, machining massive molds for laying up composite parts, you, you need one. Uh, for machining stamping dies for like off stamping out automotive panels, y you need one. Uh, they're just very expensive and very heavy. Uh, they did make these manual in the past, but most of these nowadays are, are going to be CNC machined. But they, they do make some old, old massive uh, mechanical gantry mills. 
are manual gantry mills. I mean, pretty rare. Most of these, you know, you're spending so much money on the metal, adding the CNC controller and the motors and servos isn't really as big of a deal on the bigger machines. Uh, cutters for horizontal mills, you'll see plain cutters like this that'll go on an arbor uh, for slab cutting. Uh, you know, straight cut teeth or helical cut teeth, these would be helical cut teeth, straight would be perpendicular to the face. Uh, side cutter for milling the edge of a part, maybe doing some slotting. Uh, stagger tooth, the teeth, uh, there's one for cutting on the right, one for cutting on the left. This is used for milling deep slots. Slitting saw for cutting thin uh, slots. You see these on horizontal and, and vertical mills. And this, these kind of cutters you usually see just on horizontal mills. You might use something on a, on a vertical, but usually, usually this stuff you see on horizontal. Uh, slitting saws you'll see on horizontal and vertical mills. You'll use slitting saws to do uh, uh, any kind of thin slot you need in something a slitting saw works. Because, you know, for, for this, you can cut a really deep slot in something. If you tried to use an end mill, a really long end mill through there, you'll run into deflection problems. It's going to be better to cut uh, slots like this with a slitting saw rather than a really long skinny end mill. Angle cutters uh, in different angles for making chamfers, uh, for you know, making anything where you need, need an angle profile. Uh, form cutters, they make all sorts of different shapes for cutting gear teeth. Uh, you can mill gear teeth with a gear tooth cutter. Uh, you can mill uh, different kinds of keyways. You can mill uh, chamfers or uh, uh, fillets, uh, any kind of round profile. And these are going to be specific to the kind of geometry you're trying to, to machine, uh, usually on a horizontal, but also sometimes on a vertical. You'll need an arbor to, uh, to hold these things, though. Uh, for vertical milling, uh, you use um, primarily end mills. Uh, so an end mill here, this would be like a five flute end mill. They make everything from one flute to six flute to eight flute. Uh, two and four are the most common, though. Uh, so two is usually like for aluminum, you'll use a two flute end mill. For steel, you usually use a four flute end mill. Uh, this would be a finishing end mill. It's uh, not interrupted cutting, or sorry, the, the, the cutting edge is continuous. Uh, this would be a rougher. Uh, it's designed to uh, make lots of small chips that get cleared out real easily. It uh, leaves a terrible surface finish as you can imagine, uh, which you can remove a lot of chips in a hurry. I make tapered or straight shanks. This is the shank here. Tapered or straight. Straight's more common though. Uh, straight or helical flutes. Uh, almost always helical flutes. There's some applications where you use a straight fluted end mill. Uh, they're, they're pretty rare. I think some plastic machining you use straight fluted end mills, but usually you have uh, some kind of a helix angle. Uh, flatter ball end, uh, flat end is going to have sharp corners, very sharp corners. Ball end is going to have a radius down here. Uh, you usually prefer to cut with a flat end mill if you can. Uh, ball end mills usually have problems with chips loading up uh, and you, you really want to avoid those. The main problem is the speed, the surface speed of the cutter is a lot slower on a, on a ball end mill as it gets closer to the center. Uh, and it can gum up really bad at the, at the bottom of, of a ball nose. Whereas this, you do most of your cutting here on the corner at your highest surface speed, and uh, it, the, the ball nose just don't cut anywhere near as well as a, as a sharp cornered end mill. So if you needed to make a pocket that had like a radius, a fillet at the bottom of it, you'd remove most of your material with a flat end mill and then just go trace it with a ball nose to get those corners usually. It's the fastest way to do it. Uh, center cutting or not, so some of these things you can plunge straight in. These are not drill bits. They don't work anywhere near as well as a drill bit does for plunge cutting. Uh, so usually like in CNC machining, if I need to plunge an end mill into a hole, I might actually helix it in because it just, it just cuts better because the direction of cutting is tangent to the helix. I'm not just straight trying to plunge this thing in. These things will load up with chips. Uh, if, if you just try to plunge, especially trying to plunge with the ball nose, these things will load up with chips really bad if you just try to drill a hole with them. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll drill a hole with a drill bit and then drop an end mill down in it. Uh, some of them, again, some of them, the, like the, this one, it looks like you can cut right at the center of it. Some of them, uh, there won't actually be a cutting edge at the center and you, you can't plunge it. If you try to plunge it, bad things are going to happen, but you could helix 
a non-center cutting end mill in, but then that's more of a CNC operation because you're not going to be able to helix that thing in by, by hand. Uh, depth of cut, usually about three times cutter diameter. So if you look at you know, this end mill here, the depth of cuts like this, and it's somewhere maybe about three times the diameter, that's pretty common. You know, this here, the depth of cuts that, and that's like five or six times the diameter, you run into deflection and chatter and noise problems and surface finish problems uh, and tool wear problems uh, when you get long depths of cut. So you really, three to one, sort of the magic number, anything below that, you're gonna be fine. Uh, anything more than that, you gotta be, be careful. Uh, I had to do a project where I needed to mill an inch and a half deep slot with a 5 16 end mill and it just was not pleasant. It had to take very, very tiny, delicate cuts to keep the tool from chattering or, or breaking. So you usually want uh, as low of an aspect ratio in cutting as, as possible. Uh, shell mills. So a shell mill goes on an arbor like this. Uh, they make these uh, for vertical or horizontal machining from small size to big size. And pretty pretty rare in most applications. You, you might see a little bit of this uh, depending on what, what you're doing. But again, I, I don't think I've ever used a shell mill in my life. And I've made quite a few parts on a mill. Uh, most of my stuff's pretty small though. So, you know, maybe some big, big face cutting you might do this. But again, I don't know, it's pretty, pretty rare I would say in most shops these days. Uh, form mills. Uh, you know, they make all sorts of different forms for different geometries here and you know, it's going to be specific to whatever cut application you're trying to cut different angles uh, double chamfer here you know a quarter round here uh, and they, they make different patterns for attending different geometry uh, some of this stuff if you've got a CNC machine you can just interpolate through and you don't need a form cutter but if you're doing it manually you might need a form cutter face mills uh, when I want to cut the surface uh, they make all sorts of different ones they make a uh, things that look like giant end mills kind of like this for facing uh, but usually it's preferred nowadays to use some kind of a multi insert face mill uh, I prefer using these for facing they leave a fantastic surface finish depth of cut is limited uh, but you can still take you know a fairly aggressive depth of cut on these there's different shape inserts everything from round to triangle uh, they're fairly expensive but you know you buy it once and then you buy inserts and if you treat it well it will last basically forever and you you know you won't go through inserts very quickly on these unless you're doing production runs uh, but they work fantastically for for facings and that that's by far the preferred way to do facing is with one of these multi insert face mills uh, T slot cutter you know sometimes you need a machine at T slot like in the table of a mill itself is a T slot so you use a T slot cutter to cut that uh, this is one of those things you can't really fake with the CNC machine because there's no way to interpolate in here and get this, so uh, you're still going to use a T-slot cutter on it. Uh, Woodruff key cutter like this. Uh, so for these rounded keys, in this case, you would use the cutter and I mean, it would go in the hole that way, be perpendicular to the axis that you're cutting. Uh, for cutting uh, woodruff keys, uh, you know, for just a regular square bottom key way here, you can mill that. Those mill fantastically. I've done a lot of that. Uh, but for these rounded woodruff keys, uh, you're going to have to come into the side. Fly cutting is a single point cutting. Uh, so instead of that face mill, it's got a lot of inserts here. I'm just going to spin one insert or one high speed steel uh, cutting edge around. Uh, your surface speeds usually, uh, your cutting speed's got to be pretty low because you have one cutting edge. So your, your feeds are relatively low. Your RPM is usually limited because of the balance and safety reasons for large fly cutters. Uh, uh, but you can do, you can still see fly cutters that sometimes will have a bar that'll stick really far out one side with your cutting edge. So it'll spin about this axis here. And if you want to really do a nice job facing a really big wide sheet or plate of something, uh, you can use a, you, you need a gigantic face mill that'd be really expensive. Uh, but a single point fly cutter uh, will get the whole plate and so there won't be any kind of step over marks and you get a really nice surface finish but you just cut a cut really really slow in the process of doing that. So uh, I've had to make a, an oil pan, a dry sump oil pan for an engine that needed a really good surface finish and uh, I did it with a face mill in, on a CNC machine and it, the step over on it was, was, was bad enough that I had to go through and face fly cut the whole face to get it to be, be flat on a manual machine. 
Uh, rotary table, so if you need to mill like a circle, a circle of any kind, uh, you can do a rotary table where this would clamp onto your table using a, the T-slots. Uh, and then you would mount your workpiece here, you'd turn this handle, uh, and then you'd, like your end mill would be coming down here and you'd turn the rotary table and you can mill circular arcs. Uh, dividing head, if I need to cut something like splines or a gear, uh, I'll use a gear form cutter and then uh, a dividing head will have an array of holes here and those will be at different fractions of 360 degrees uh, and you can rotate this thing down around like if you needed a 36 tooth gear there'll be a setting for this where you can go through and there'll be 36 different holes you can park this thing in and it'll rotate this thing a 36th of a revolution uh, and it'll hold it in a precise location so dividing heads when you need to uh, break it this hold something in a precise fraction of a, of a revolution uh, again, for gears, cutting splines, things things like that. So a rotary table you usually drive the rotary table and machine. And this you'll set this at an angle and then do an operation and then use the dividing head to set it at a different angle and then do the, repeat that operation over and over again. Uh, CNC machines, computer control. Basically, we just put servos on all the axes and have a computer program run it. Uh, I don't want to say higher precision. In general, they are because they're more rigid machines, but it's not anything inherent in the CNC part that makes it more precise. Uh, you know, it's more flexible for sure, and it's usually faster, uh, but precision wise, it's mainly down to the machines are just beefier. Uh, obviously, more complex shapes because you're not having to move hand wheels by hand. Uh, two or three axis. Not three axis is really common. Four axis, you might see some kind of a rotary axis. Five axis, you'll see ones where the bed can rotate this way and rotate that way. Uh, you'll also see some five axis where the, the tool can uh, turn at an angle and, and rotate around in two more, two more axes. Uh, you see a couple of different kinds. Gantry mill is usually the, the movements in the head. For big die making machines, you might see that the bed will have the two axes on it, two extra rotational axes on it. Uh, five axis would be about the most you'd get to. You start to get into some fancy mill turn machines, might have more axes than that, but those are more like a lathe than a mill. Uh, mills usually stop somewhere around five axes. I love an automatic tool changer in most cases. You really want an automatic tool changer. Uh, you know, see something like this, you can see it's around 20 horsepower, uh, which it gets to be quite quite a lot of power, actually. 20 horsepower is a lot of power. Uh, tool changer, I can't really tell in, in this one, if, you know, if it doesn't have a tool changer. Uh, but tool changers come from 10 to 100, depending on the kind of machine, what you're doing with it, but you really, really want automatic tool changing. It really slows the process down when you're changing tools by hand. Uh, high speed machining is almost always computer controlled nowadays. There's a lot of research in the area of high speed machining. Um, you need high spindle power, high feed rates, high speeds, uh, really high cut, cutter surface speeds, you know, in the thousands of feet per minute really high spindle speeds 10 maybe even 20,000 rpm uh, really interesting cutting profiles instead of just ramming an end mill straight through a part you might actually move it in these little kind of trochoidal arcs through a part uh, i've seen all sorts of interesting different profiles for high speed machining uh, there's a lot of research in this area there's a lot of fun videos on the internet i'll try to find a couple and link at the bottom of this because i can't show the videos that are in, that are embedded uh, but there's a lot of interesting stuff on, on the internet on high speed machining and I'll skip these videos and I'll just put the links in the description below. Uh, so uh, that's it for, for milling. Again, I'll skip these videos, but I'll, I'll post links to them so you guys, you guys can see them. Uh, milling is very common. Uh, you need a mill, you need a lathe to have a machine shop. And then from, from there are some choices, but until you've got both of those, you really don't have a complete machine shop. Uh, you know, it's really um, frustrating, I'm sure, for you all that the, if you didn't get to work on, on your clock and do the use the milling and turning operations on that. Again, if you want that kind of experience, I highly recommend joining one of the design teams and you can get more machining experience in, than you ever want on those. It's something that I found very rewarding when I was on a design team uh, and I, I really like teaching people how to, how to use this equipment. It's fun for, to learn. It's, it's really, really cool to be able to take a block of metal and turn it into uh, some kind of a 
to some kind of a complicated shape for some specific use. It's, it's a fun thing to do. So I uh, hope you all get to experience that. Uh, that's it for this lecture. Uh, there'll be another quiz homework that I'll post on this uh, here in a little bit. Uh, that's it. Thank you.